Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Here when you need us most, now and always. Johnson & Johnson. Summit Health, a provider of primary, specialty, and urgent care. PSE&G, committed to providing safe, reliable energy, now and in the future. Wells Fargo. The New Jersey Education Association. The Russell Berry Foundation, making a difference. And by New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and by bestofnj.com, all New Jersey in one place. Hi, folks. I'm Steve Adubato. We're going to get right into this um, with Dr. Maureen Coyle, psychologist and visiting professor at Seton Hall University. Doctor, great to have you with us. Thank you Can for we... having me. I'm sorry for interrupting. We're going to be talking about social media and, and technology, and so the delay is normal. So how about this? Um, I've been obsessed by the fact that not just our 11-year-old daughter, Olivia, and, but countless millions of other teens the phone, Instagram, Twitter, and then I want to have a conversation and it's very hard. I take the phone away for two minutes, she thinks it's been 20. The prefrontal cortex of children not fully developed, which impacts their impulse control, help us understand. Sure, so our brains develop back to front. So we first get the visual and then we get the prefrontal cortex develops last. That's in charge of your planning, your decision making. So that doesn't fully develop until your late 20s, some estimates even early 30s. So these children and adolescents are at increased risk of not being able to manage their technology use well because a part of the brain that tells them, hey, you've been spending too much time on Instagram isn't developed yet. So it's harder for them to develop good habits when their brain actually isn't fully developed to help them build those good habits. Advice for parents, uh, by the way, our, our director and our uh, audio expert just saying, hey, listen, I'm taking the phone away and I don't care if the kid's upset. Me, I actually want my daughter to like me, um, which is, makes me a weak parent, a weak father. Give us some advice. Absolutely. So as we all know, when it comes to children and teenagers, when we tell them no, that just makes them want to do it more. And <laughs> It really starts with the parents having good habits because children pick up everything that parents do. So if the parents are on their phone a lot, not paying attention to their children, they need to break that habit in themselves. So their children are more likely to see a good model of good habits with the technology. And it's also important to help children understand the dangers of the technology, understanding that whatever they post online goes into that digital world and it's there forever. So, uh, you know, I've heard some people say, if you wouldn't want your grandparents to see it, then don't post it. And I think that's pretty good advice for thinking about things that we might easily be embarrassed by that we wouldn't want family members to see. So thinking more mindfully about what we're going to be doing online and then also trying to push children and adolescents to engage in self-reflection. After they're scrolling, how do they feel? Do they feel good? Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they lonely? If they're feeling more of those negative emotions, then for themselves, they should be thinking, well, maybe I should be spending my time on something else that isn't going to make me feel more sad or lonely or anxious, et cetera. So as we do this program at the end of 2021, it'll be seen in 2022. There are hearings going on in Congress. They'll continue to go on. And leaders of social media platforms, yes, Facebook, I, I, their parent name is what it is right now, and, they've, and they own Instagram, correct? Correct. And WhatsApp. And WhatsApp. My wife, by the way, my wife, I don't know if Jennifer is going to watch this, but Jen, you got to put the phone down when I'm talking to you and we're telling Olivia to put her phone down. I do the same. We're all guilty. That being said, 
Do you find that social media CEOs, leaders are acknowledging that their algorithms, that their mechanism to figure mechanisms to figure out what gets kids, preteens, teens into it, that they are manipulating that information, that they are utilizing and hooking kids into stuff that's unhealthy for them. Are they acknowledging it? A and B. If they're not, does Congress have a role in regulating it? So I think that they have to reckon with it. There has been a call from psychologists like myself to get Meta and other large uh, technology. Meta, the parent company of, of Facebook. Go ahead. To be, you know, more explicit on what they are doing online because they do their own independent research and it doesn't go through the same standards as the research that we do by getting ethical approval from a board. So I think that they have to, no matter what, recognize that we are seeing effects. We are seeing the mental health of our children and adolescents being hurt right now and they're spending so much time online and they don't know exactly how to use it well. And it's hard when you have uh, these companies, they make more money the more that their users are engaging with them. So trying to get them to work against their own financial interest is going to be challenging. So I think a push to have regulation might be inevitable for the sake of all of our well-being. Because like you said, you know, uh, it's hard for even adults to manage their time well online and, and not just be looking at their phone when they're having a conversation. So it's something that we really need to have regulation on if we're going to actually be able to push these companies into the direction to consider the ramifications on our well-being. And by the way, I don't even want to disclose or admit how often I go down a rabbit hole on some social media platform. And an hour later, I'm thinking, what did I just do? So I don't want to be holier than now in this. Real quick, I also want to acknowledge that Seton Hall University, one of our higher ed partners, um, in which we identify academics and scholars to come and talk about these things. And I, I want to ask you this, as we have about a minute left, disproportionate impact on teenage girls, pre-teenage young women than boys? If so, what is it? Yes. So we are seeing, when it comes to Instagram specifically, having more of an effect on adolescent girls in terms of their self-consciousness, their self-esteem, because they are being bombarded with these images of perfectly sculpted bodies, and it really makes them internalize negative feelings about themselves. So we also are seeing more um, self-harm and suicide ideation in teenage girls, more so than boys. So they seem to be getting even more negative effects on how they are seeing themselves in relation to what they see on Instagram specifically. And that being said, let's be clear. Uh, I know that uh, for the cover of a book I wrote, they airbrushed it. They did certain things that make you not have as many lines. I, okay, fine. Yeah, I did. But that we're talking about every day, all the time with people who don't tell you that on social media. So you're looking at this woman or this young girl and saying, hey, look at me. Look, we play games with people, with kids' minds, do we not? And their self-esteem. Absolutely. 30 seconds or less. So there has been a push to actually have um, a warning or banner to say that this picture has been airbrushed. I know that it's moved forward in, in Europe in some countries. So I hope that we see something like that here where people can see this is Photoshopped. This isn't a realistic body. By the way, Dr. Cole, I want to thank you so much. We appreciate you putting perspective on this. And let me disclose now, in an upcoming book in the next year, it will, the cover will be airbrushed. I'm just telling everybody right now, get that out of the way. Thank you, doctor. Well, all the best. Thank you for having me. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more Think Tank with Steve Adubato programs and to listen to Think Tank with Steve Adubato, the podcast, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. I'm very grateful that I'm still here. That's me and my daughter when we went to celebrate our first anniversary. With a new kidney, I have strength. They gave me a new lease on life. I'm still going everywhere and exploring new places. Nobody thought I was going to be here. Nobody. And I look forward to getting older with my wife. That's possible now. We're transforming lives through innovative kidney treatments, living donor programs, and world-renowned care at two of New Jersey's premier hospitals. They gave me my normal life back. It's a blessing. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. We're now joined by Dale Florio. He's a Republican strategist and managing partner at Princeton Public Affairs Group. Good to see you, Dale. 
Always good to see you, Steve. We've had so many interesting conversations about politics. We try not to do it from an insider's perspective, but rather help people who are not involved every day make sense of it. Help them make sense, not just as a Republican uh, strategist, but as a key advisor to the Jack Chitterelli campaign. We're doing this show at the end of the end of 2021. What was the most significant message you believe that voters should take away from that election with Governor Murphy? You know, <laughs> elections are always about momentum. And when you look at the, uh, the popularity or lack of popularity of the president at the time in New Jersey, that created a real backdrop. Pre president uh, Biden, not President, president Biden, right. It created a backdrop uh, that people just weren't happy. That combined with the pandemic, um, you know, created a backdrop for a, a challenger to, to run a, an aggressive campaign. Um, the other thing, too, is that, you know, Republicans have, um, you know, the President Trump did not do well in, with the electorate in New Jersey, right? I mean, you know, if you're an ardent Trump supporter. He got beat by 16 points in 2020. Right. I mean, you know, it just did not do well. He obviously has base of support. But, you know, I think if you're on the other side, on the Democratic side, you know, you think that that momentum lasts forever and it, and it just doesn't. Uh, we saw this when Jim Florio was running, ran for governor. He won during his midterms. I mean, we elected Republican assembly members in Hudson County that in the midterms. And so Republicans got used to winning because they thought it was all about them. But it, it's about momentum. And then when the president, President Trump, came to office and, and really got beat up pretty well in New Jersey, I think Democrats got comfortable thinking that that's how the voters were always going to respond. And it, so you got to you got to really feel the momentum. You got to understand what's going on at, at the higher levels. Well, let me ask you this, though, Dale. Uh, again, you've always been someone, not just as a Republican strategist, but someone as you know, a lobbyist who who talks to all kinds of people across the aisle, the bipartisan thing, getting things done. Jack Chitterelli has the same track record. So here's my question: In such a polarized if you're not with me and you're not with my party and you're not with Trump or you're not with Biden, you must be my enemy. You've never worked that way. Jack Chitterelli has never worked that way. New Jersey has never worked that way. Where does a New Jersey Republican who's moderate slash conservative function in a party that is led by the former president who, respectfully, it's not my opinion, he just doesn't see bipartisanship in the same way? Well, I think, you know, whether you're in New Jersey or any other state, maybe that the President Trump did not do well in, you, you have to talk about the issues. And uh, sure, you're going to take incoming from the other side. Uh, you're going to get people that have been big supporters of Donald Trump uh, wondering why you're not embracing the former president. But, you know, you, at the end of the day, you look at the data and, and you're right, Steve, New Jersey is a very moderate state. It kind of goes a little left and it's been going a little left more often than not. Not as blue as people think. Not as blue as people think. Right. It's a it's a sl slightly center left state. So you have to you have to understand that and then talk about the messages. I mean, the federal election, the presidential election was over last year. Now, you know, certainly the Murphy campaign was smart to try to make continue to make that connection. But, you know, I, th I think what you saw was a, a Republican candidate trying to talk to the, the, the larger mass in the middle and try to knit together those folks that were supportive of the president with, uh, you know, people that were not happy with what was going on nationally uh, under President Biden. Dale, break down some of the key issues and concerns of New Jersey voters, not just for that election in that election, but moving into 2022 when this program is be being seen. What are those core issues? <laughs> uh, Steve, you know, it, it's always property taxes. I mean, it just, it, it's always property taxes. Um, you know, I just if you got don't... my bill, I can appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, listen, both parties have taken runs at it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy. Uh, it's, it's not easy. Uh, but it will continue to be property taxes. So how do we, how do we make sure that New Jersey's affordable? Um, and that becomes the challenge. I know on the, the Chitterelli side, the idea was to start with a new school funding formula. Uh, now, you know, Jack's not going to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, but that's where, you know, that's a, that's a big chunk of what gets spent at the local level.
Changing and state aid to certain municipalities for their schools, particularly in Hoboken and Jersey City, where Jack Cittarelli um, said, hey, listen, those are wealthier urban communities that are growing, their tax base is stronger. Um, but let's be clear that property taxes are in many, many ways a product of that state aid. So how would changing state aid in education lower property taxes? Well, it would just it would it would help the communities that are paying a far, far greater share. Right. And it would certainly force communities to look at their educational system or are they overstaffed? Um, but there are a lot of communities that are paying higher property taxes um, than other places that get a lot more aid. So, you know, population shift, uh, school population shift, um, you know, legislators on both sides of the aisle have talked about uh, the school funding formula for a long time. I mean, the last time we did this was under John, John Corzine and every, it was, it was a bipartisan, uh, product. Well, things change pop, as I said, population shift. Now's one of those times the state probably should take an, another look at it, but it's not easy. It's not easy at all it, it, because there are winners and losers. Yeah. Give, give me COVID, COVID mandates, vaccines loaded. I know, and it's impact on the political culture in our state. Um, listen, I, I think, I think people are just tired. You know, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, they're just tired. It's not the governor's fault. I mean, this is an international pandemic, uh, and, uh, folks are, are just tired of it. So I think what you saw, whether you are fully vaccinated or you're not, uh, people are just tired. And I think it, it, that's the angst to the extent that that had any impact on the election, um, was what people are feeling. I mean, Everybody had their lane in terms of what they said about uh, vaccinations, masks, other protocols. But I think what you saw were just people that are just, just tired. But, but the way elections, real quick on this, the way elections are going to be run, more mail-in ballots, more different, different ways of voting, will it continue to cause people to question the outcome of elections because elections are run so differently and votes are counted so differently? Dale? Listen, Republicans need to do a better job with the vote by mail uh, program. Um, but I also think that vote by mails will become a less and less of a factor because with early voting, I think more and more people will take advantage of going to the ballot box, you know, that nine days before. Right now, the law is nine days, right? You can get, you can go vote on a machine. I think we'll see more people doing that. Um, Kudos to both candidates. Uh, neither Governor Murphy or uh, Chitterelli uh, complained about uh, the, the voting apparatus, how it was counted. I think the legislature is looking, and I and I, I think the governor is interested in looking to see how we can, you know, speed up the counting. Right. I mean, we grew up at a time, Steve, when you know, you by election by the time you went to bed on election night, you knew who won. Right. And people still expect that to be the case, but the way the law is set up in terms of being able to count vote by mails. What we call provisional ballots, uh, ballots that were mailed but have a postmark. You can still count those seven days later. Um, we've got to figure out a way. How, how can we shorten that time frame? Uh, especially you get these low municipal elections where the you know there could be a difference of five votes. You're waiting another two or three weeks to figure out who won, and and then maybe a challenge. Dale Flora is a Republican strategist, managing partner at Princeton Public Affairs Group. Dale, as always, thank you for your uh, perspective on things. All the best as this is seen in 2022 in the new year to you and your family. Thanks, Dale. Same to you, Steve. Take care now. You got it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. To see more Think Tank with Steve Adubato programs and to listen to Think Tank with Steve Adubato, the podcast, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. I'm very grateful that I'm still here. That's me and my daughter when we went to celebrate our first anniversary. With a new kidney, I have strength. They gave me a new lease on life. 
I'm still going everywhere and exploring new places. Nobody thought I was going to be here. Nobody. Now I look forward to getting older with my wife. That's possible now. We're transforming lives through innovative kidney treatments, living donor programs, and world-renowned care at two of New Jersey's premier hospitals. They gave me my normal life back. It's a blessing. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. The public television family is honored to join our good friend Joetta, who is a four-time Olympian, entrepreneur, and motivational speaker. This is, as I said, part of our uh, the Women in Leadership Initiative done in cooperation with the Business and Industry Association of New Jersey. Joetta, how you doing, my friend? I am doing well, thank you. That picture over your right shoulder of you up with the big the swoosh, that's you. That is me. Actually, that was me from 1996. I was in, in the Nike campaign for women over 30. And that outfit was the initial part of the John Gra and the brief that we now wear. The bras are really short now, but back then, that was as much skin as we were showing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put it in perspective. Um, yes. Joetta, you are a motivator. You um, have lived it. You've walked the walk. You've run the run, if you will. Um, yes. The, the, the got to do keynote message that you delivered um, in so many conferences, including with the Business and Industry Association of New Jersey, got to do, got to do what? Well, you know what, well, thank you very much. I was honored to be part of that conference. And the got to do is what is inside of you. So for me, I've got to make sure that I'm making a difference in people's lives uh, via health, motivation, wealth, and finance. So that got to do is that thing that bugs you in the deep mires of your soul. So it varies for different people. But the one thing that doesn't vary is that you got to put in the work. So for people who get stuck, for people who say, I'm going to do this, I, they, don't, they haven't done it yet. Yes. I'm, going to, I'm going to start working out. I'm going to start a business. I'm going to do whatever. But it's been a while that they've been saying that, Joetta. Yes. What is your message to them right now as they're watching? Well, my message to them is that if you got to do something, then you have to feel it. And if you're not feeling it, that means it doesn't matter to you. So what is it inside of you that is relevant, that, that you dream and think about? And then you know your purpose, you get prepared, you be patient, you get perturbed, and you persevere. And those are my P's that uh, I use in everything, in all walks of life. So anyone that wants to, that has to do something, has to do something is not really relevant, because I would like to do something. It would be nice if I did something, but the got to do, you got to do this. So when I was, uh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, no, you're the one. Listen, so I was, was going to sit there talking about my weak workouts, and I have a little no excuses sign that I always look at because I'm making excuses, but you're the one who's really motivating everyone. So what were you about to say? I was going to say when I was trying to make the Olympic team, and it would have been nice to say it would be nice if I make the team, but I was in fourth place at one time, and I got to get the third place to make the team because they only took three people. So that is the thing that's inside of you that, you know, it has to happen right now, not tomorrow, next week, but right now. Joetta, you, the brand of Joetta, first of all, explain to us why the one name Joetta to the branding of it. And three, you also have some other aspects of this branding initiative. Talk about it, Joetta. Yes, well, the one name is simple. You've heard of Oprah, Madonna, Magic, Socrates. Now you have Joetta. So that's Love what, it. <laughs> there you go. And it works with the brand. So I have a line of perfume and body splash and body scrubs that all goes under Joetta. And I thought it sounds really well. So we go by the one name, Joetta. I'm going to ask you something. Your passion for fitness, your passion for wellness. Do you connect? Because in my crazy, I shouldn't use the word crazy, but in my mind, in order to do this work, and you and I have had so many interviews over the years, so many conversations, in my mind, I correlate as a non-real athlete working out and taking care of myself and wellness with doing this work, meaning you have to have the energy to do this and do it well for a long period of time. Do you connect wellness to your business acumen and passion for business, or are they just two separate things? Absolutely. Business, fitness, it all works together. We believe in a strong body, strong mind that equals a strong future. And so if you want to be successful in anything, you have to have a good body. 
So we had this new uh, venture called Joe Time Fitness. And I was again, Joe Time, Joe again. Time Fitness, J-O-T-Y-M-E Fitness, Joe Time Fitness. And what we do there is we meet you where you are. But we want you to know that if you have a strong body, strong mind, it will equal a strong future. So someone says, particularly women watching right now, you know, I would like to, I believe in what Joetta is saying. She's, she's motivating. She's obviously, uh, as I said, walk the walk, and she's, it speaks for itself. And by the way, Google Joetta, find out all about her accomplishments as an Olympian. But you know what? Kids, spouse, significant other, significant other whatever, work, stress, COVID, it's a long list. At what point are they not excuses, Joetta, but rather real challenges that have to be overcome? Well, you know what, Steve? We always say you have to put yourself first. And that is what we have been putting through all this year. You are a priority. If you're not taking care of yourself, you will be no good for anyone else. So although those are real issues, real challenges, Nothing's more real than you being healthy, financially, mentally, and spiritually. So if you don't put yourself first, then you will be put somewhere else where no one will be able to see you. So we believe in putting yourself first. Take 15 to 20 minutes at Joe Time Fitness. That's what we give, 20 minutes, Steve. And you will have a solid program that will get you ready for the rest of your day. So as a student of leadership who teaches, coaches it, and makes mistakes at leadership every single day, many times a day, I'm curious about this. Um, I've asked every leader who's come on how he or she has dealt with COVID. COVID has impacted your life, those around you. Has it deterred you in any way from pursuing what you're doing or, in fact, invigorated you or something in between? Well, as the motivational leader and an authority on wellness and achievement and accomplishment, COVID did two things. One, it helped me to realize the significance of life and being present. And the second thing it did was it helped me get things in order. So from a business perspective, it allowed me time to redo my mission statement, to get my team together, to get new material out, and to be relevant for the now. And the now is that I'm back out speaking. I am back out motivating. I have a podcast out. We have Joe Time Fitness going on. So all of this was developed during the quiet time of COVID. So you use that time, even though, as I said, there's been loss in your family, and particularly in the last year, you use that time to regroup. Absolutely. COVID was a time for you to regroup, for you to rethink, for you to become rejuvenated. And although you were going through challenges, the fact of the matter is that you're still here. And since you're still here, you're here for a purpose. So let's get busy. What was that purpose? What does that got to do? So the guy to do might have been a business. It might have been a relationship. I don't know what it was, but it needed your time and your energy. So that's what I did. I put everything into the business and we redeveloping it, becoming more relevant. So when we came out of the pandemic, the pivot was easy for me. Hey, Joetta, next time I'm in our home gym working out and yes. doing some weak, lazy, lame workout, <laughs> I'm just going to think about you. You me yourself. <laughs> I, I'm, just, I'm just saying that sometimes I'm going through the motions, but I'm going to think about everything you just said and do what I have to do. I, you got to do it. Got to do it. Hey, Joetta, thank you. You honor us by joining us on this Women in Leadership series. All the best, my friend. Thank you very much. That's Joetta, just Joetta, and I'm Steve Adubato. I am not at the point where I can just go by one name. She is. Thank you, Joy. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by RWJ Barnabas Health, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Johnson & Johnson, Summit Health, PSE&G, Wells Fargo, the New Jersey Education Association, the Russell Berry Foundation, and by New Jersey Sharing Network. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and by bestofnj.com.
I'm very grateful that I'm still here. That's me and my daughter when we went to celebrate our first anniversary. With a new kidney, I have strength. They gave me a new lease on life. I'm still going everywhere and exploring new places. Nobody thought I was going to be here. Nobody. And I look forward to getting older with my wife. That's possible now. We're transforming lives through innovative kidney treatments, living donor programs, and world-renowned care at two of New Jersey's premier hospitals. They gave me my normal life back. It's a blessing. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together.